now from the White House in Washington, President Nixon. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Ten days ago, in my report to the nation on Vietnam, I announced the decision to withdraw an additional 150,000 Americans from Vietnam over the next year. I said then that I was making that decision despite our concern over increased enemy activity in Laos, in Cambodia, and in South Vietnam. And at that time, I warned that if I concluded that increased enemy activity in any of these areas endangered the lives of Americans remaining in Vietnam, I would not hesitate to take strong and effective measures to deal with that situation. Despite that warning, North Vietnam has increased its military aggression in all these areas, and particularly in Cambodia. After full consultation, with the National Security Council, Ambassador Bunker, General Abrams, and my other advisors, I have concluded that the actions of the enemy in the last 10 days clearly endanger the lives of Americans who are in Vietnam now and would constitute an unacceptable risk to those who will be there after withdrawal of another 150,000. To protect our men who are in Vietnam, and to guarantee the continued success of our withdrawal and Vietnamization programs, I have concluded that the time has come for action. Tonight, I shall describe the actions of the enemy, the actions I have ordered to deal with that situation, and the reasons for my decision. Cambodia, a small country of seven million people has been a neutral nation since the Geneva Agreement of 1954, an agreement, incidentally, which was signed by the government of North Vietnam. American policy since then has been to scrupulously respect the neutrality of the Cambodian people. We have maintained a skeleton diplomatic mission of fewer than 15 in Cambodia's capital, and that only since last August. For the previous four years, from 1965 to 1969, we did not have any diplomatic mission whatever in Cambodia. And for the past five years, we have provided no military assistance whatever and no economic assistance to Cambodia. North Vietnam, however, has not respected that neutrality. For the past five years, as indicated on this map that you see here, North Vietnam has occupied military sanctuaries all along the Cambodian frontier with South Vietnam. Some of these extend up to 20 miles into Cambodia. The sanctuaries are in red, and as you note, they are on both sides of the border. They are used for hit and run attacks on American and South Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. These communist occupied territories contain major base camps, training sites, logistics facilities, weapons and ammunition factories, airstrips, and prisoner of war compounds. And for five years, neither the United States nor South Vietnam has moved against these enemy sanctuaries because we did not wish to violate the territory of a neutral nation. Even after the Vietnamese communists began to expand these sanctuaries four weeks ago, we counseled patience to our South Vietnamese allies and imposed restraints on our own commanders. In contrast to our policy, the enemy in the past two weeks has stepped up his guerrilla actions, and he is concentrating his main forces in these sanctuaries that you see on this map, where they are building up to launch massive attacks on our forces and those of South Vietnam. North Vietnam, in the last two weeks, has stripped away all pretense of respecting the sovereignty or the neutrality of Cambodia. Thousands of their soldiers are invading the country from the sanctuaries, 
They are encircling the capital of Phnom Penh. Coming from these sanctuaries, as you see here, they have moved into Cambodia and are encircling the capital. Cambodia, as a result of this, has sent out a call to the United States, to a number of other nations, for assistance. Because if this enemy effort succeeds, Cambodia would become a vast enemy staging area and a springboard for attacks on South Vietnam along 600 miles of frontier. A refuge where enemy troops could return from combat without fear of retaliation. North Vietnamese men and supplies could then be poured into that country, jeopardizing not only the lives of our own men, but the people of South Vietnam as well. Now confronted with this situation, we have three options. First, we can do nothing. Well, the ultimate result of that course of action is clear. Unless we indulge in wishful thinking, the lives of Americans remaining in Vietnam after our next withdrawal of 150,000 would be gravely threatened. Let us go to the map again. Here is South Vietnam. Here is North Vietnam. North Vietnam already occupies this part of Laos. If North Vietnam also occupied this whole band in Cambodia or the entire country, it would mean that South Vietnam was completely outflanked and the forces of Americans in this area as well as the South Vietnamese would be in an untenable military position. Our second choice is to provide massive military assistance to Cambodia itself. Now, unfortunately, while we deeply sympathize with the plight of seven million Cambodians whose country has been, been invaded, massive amounts of military assistance could not be rapidly and effectively utilized by the small Cambodian army against the immediate threat. With other nations, we should do our best to provide the small arms and other equipment which the Cambodian army of 40,000 needs and can use for its defense. But the aid we will provide will be limited to the purpose of enabling Cambodia to defend its neutrality and not for the purpose of making it an active belligerent on one side or the other. Our third choice is to go to the heart of the trouble. And that means cleaning out major North Vietnamese and Viet Cong occupied territories these sanctuaries which serve as bases for attacks on both Cambodia and American and South Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. Some of these, incidentally, are as close to Saigon as Baltimore is to Washington. This one, for example, is called the Parrot's Beak. It's only 33 miles from Saigon. Now faced with these three options, this is the decision I have made. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. A major responsibility for the ground operations is being assumed by South Vietnamese forces. For example, the attacks in several areas, including the Parrot's Peak that I referred to a moment ago, are exclusively, exclusively South Vietnamese ground operations under South Vietnamese command, with the United States providing air and logistical support. There is one area, however, immediately above Parrot's Peak, where I have concluded that a combined American and South Vietnamese operation is necessary. Tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. This key control center has been occupied by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong for five years in blatant violation of Cambodia's neutrality. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. 
The areas in which these attacks will be launched are completely occupied and controlled by North Vietnamese forces. Our purpose is not to occupy the areas. Once enemy forces are driven out of these sanctuaries, and once their military supplies are destroyed, we will withdraw. These actions are in no way directed to the security interests of any nation. Any government that chooses to use these actions as a pretext for harming relations with the United States will be doing so on its own responsibility and on its own initiative, and we will draw the appropriate conclusions. And now let me give you the reasons for my decision. A majority of the American people, a majority of you listening to me, are for the withdrawal of our forces from Vietnam. The action I have taken tonight is indispensable for the continuing success of that withdrawal program. A majority of the American people want to end this war rather than to have it drag on interminably. The action I have taken tonight will serve that purpose. A majority of the American people want to keep the casualties of our brave men in Vietnam at an absolute minimum. The action I take tonight is essential if we are to accomplish that goal. We take this action not for the purpose of expanding the war into Cambodia, but for the purpose of ending the war in Vietnam and winning the just peace we all desire. We have made, we will continue to make, every possible effort to end this war through negotiation at the conference table rather than through more fighting on the battlefield. Let's look again at the record. We've stopped the bombing of North Vietnam. We have cut air operations by over 20%. We've announced the withdrawal of over 250,000 of our men. We've offered to withdraw all of our men if they will withdraw theirs. We've offered to negotiate all issues with only one condition, and that is that the future of South Vietnam be determined not by North Vietnam and not by the United States, but by the people of South Vietnam themselves. The answer of the enemy has been intransigence at the conference table, belligerence at Hanoi, massive military aggression in Laos and Cambodia, and stepped-up tax in South Vietnam designed to increase American casualties. This attitude has become intolerable. We will not react to this threat to American lives merely by plenty diplomatic protests. If we did, the credibility of the United States would be destroyed in every area of the world where only the power of the United States deters aggression. Tonight, I again warn the North Vietnamese that if they continue to escalate the fighting when the United States is withdrawing its forces, I shall meet my responsibility as Commander-in-Chief of our armed forces to take the action I consider necessary to defend the security of our American men. The action that I have announced tonight puts the leaders of North Vietnam on notice that we will be patient in working for peace. We will be conciliatory at the conference table, but we will not be humiliated. We will not be defeated. We will not allow American men by the thousands to be killed by an enemy from privileged sanctuaries. The time came long ago to end this war through peaceful negotiations. We stand ready for those negotiations. We have made major efforts, many of which must remain secret. I say tonight all the offers and approaches made previously remain on the conference table whenever Hanoi is ready to negotiate seriously. But if the enemy response to our most conciliatory offers for peaceful negotiation continues to be to increase its attacks and humiliate and defeat us, we shall react accordingly. My fellow Americans, we live in an age of anarchy both abroad and at home. 
we see mindless attacks on all the great institutions which have been created by free civilizations in the last 500 years. Even here in the United States, great universities are being systematically destroyed. Small nations all over the world find themselves under attack from within and from without. If when the chips are down, the world's most powerful nation, the United States of America, acts like a pitiful, helpless giant. The forces of totalitarianism and anarchy will threaten free nations and free institutions throughout the world. It is not our power, but our will and character that is being tested tonight. The question all Americans must ask and answer tonight is this. Does the richest and strongest nation in the history of the world have the character to meet a direct challenge by a group which rejects every effort to win a just peace, ignores our warning, tramples on solemn agreements, violates the neutrality of an unarmed people, and uses our prisoners as hostages? If we fail to meet this challenge, all other nations will be on notice that despite its overwhelming power, the United States, when a real crisis comes, will be found wanting. During my campaign for the presidency, I pledged to bring Americans home from Vietnam. They are coming home. I promise to end this war. I shall keep that promise. I promise to win a just peace. I shall keep that promise. We shall avoid a wider war. But we are also determined to put an end to this war. In this room, Woodrow Wilson made the great decisions which led to victory in World War I. Franklin Roosevelt made the decisions which led to our victory in World War II. Dwight D. Eisenhower made decisions which ended the war in Korea and avoided war in the Middle East. John F. Kennedy in his finest hour, made the great decision which removed Soviet nuclear missiles from Cuba and the Western Hemisphere. I have noted that there's been a great deal of discussion with regard to this decision that I've made. And I should point out that I do not contend that it is in the same magnitude as these decisions that I have just mentioned. But between those decisions and this decision, there is a difference that is very fundamental. In those decisions, the American people were not assailed by counsels of doubt and defeat from some of the most widely known opinion leaders of the nation. I have noted, for example, that a Republican senator has said that this action I have taken means that my party has lost all chance of winning the November elections. And others are saying today that this move against enemy sanctuaries will make me a one-term president. No one is more aware than I am of the political consequences of the action I have taken. It is tempting to take the easy political path, to blame this war on previous administrations and to bring all of our men home immediately regardless of the consequences, even though that would mean defeat for the United States, to desert 18 million South Vietnamese people who have put their trust in us, to expose them to the same slaughter and savagery which the leaders of North Vietnam inflicted on hundreds of thousands of North Vietnamese who chose freedom when the communists took over North Vietnam in 1954. To get peace at any price now, even though I know that a peace of humiliation for the United States would lead to a bigger war or surrender later. I have rejected all political considerations in making this decision. Whether my party gains in November is nothing compared to the lives of 400,000 brave Americans fighting for our country and for the cause of peace and freedom in Vietnam. 
whether I may be a one-term president, is insignificant compared to whether, by our failure to act in this crisis, the United States proves itself to be unworthy to lead the forces of freedom in this critical period in world history. I would rather be a one-term president and do what I believe was right than to be a two-term president at the cost of seeing America become a second-rate power and to see this nation accept the first defeat in its proud 190-year history. I realize that in this war, there are honest and deep differences in this country about whether we should have become involved, that there are differences to how the war should have been conducted. But the decision I announced tonight transcends those differences, for the lives of American men are involved. The opportunity for 150,000 Americans to come home in the next 12 months is involved. The future of 18 million people in South Vietnam and 7 million people in Cambodia is involved possibility of winning a just peace in Vietnam and in the Pacific is at stake. It is customary to conclude a speech from the White House by asking support for the President of the United States. Tonight, I depart from that President. What I ask is far more important. I ask for your support for our brave men fighting tonight halfway around the world, not for territory, not for glory, but so that their younger brothers and their sons and your sons can have a chance to grow up in a world of peace and freedom and justice. Thank you and good night. And so the president has announced that tonight I'm David Brinkley, NBC News. Kent State University in Ohio has had campus violence for three nights, causing the National Guard to be called in. And today the guardsmen open fire on the students, killing four of them, two young men and two young women. Three were shot in the chest and one in the head. A dozen or more others were wounded, some by gunfire and some by bayonets. The university is closed and all faculty and students have been sent home. The students were protesting the American invasion of Cambodia. The National Guard was called in over the weekend by Ohio Governor James Rhodes. Today, when 1,500 students started an anti-war rally on the university commons, the guardsmen surrounded them then, when some students started throwing rocks, the guard moved in with tear gas. were forced up a hill by the tear gas. Some of them started throwing gas canisters back at the guardsmen. Others threw rocks. Then a formation of guardsmen marched up the hill and fired their rifles at the students. two young women were killed and at least a dozen other students were wounded. It took university officials two hours to disperse the students. Then the university was closed for the remainder of the week. The guard has sealed off the city. Assistant Adjutant General Frederick Wenger said later the guardsmen did not open fire until after they came under sniper fire themselves. 
Governor Rhodes has asked FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to investigate the shootings. Fred DeBrine, NBC News, reporting. The National Students Association called for a shutdown of all university campuses in all states to protest the Cambodian War. Father Theodore Hesburg, president of Notre Dame University, spoke to a student rally and said his reaction to the invasion was revulsion, but said he didn't want and would not accept any kind of student strike. President Cordier of Columbia University supported a moratorium against the war, a day of closing down regular classes for discussions. In New Haven, Yale students and others demonstrated over the weekend, but managed to keep it reasonably peaceful. Today, New Haven returned to life. To the surprise of many citizens, their town was still there, and many seemed to have changed their opinions of Yale students and demonstrations. Yes, what did you think of the weekend? Comparatively quiet to what we expected. Were you surprised by the way it went? I am. I am. I'm quite surprised. Uh, the noise that you've been hearing on all the other campuses, I think everyone expected a lot of trouble. Why do you think it was different here? I think it was an organized group. I was down here on Friday and Saturday as I was working, and I noticed that in the marshals controlling the crowd, there was a couple times when it looked like it was going to blow up, but they kept it in hand for the police to get away. We were closed, and the normal uh, transit people would not come downtown. So you blame that on the demonstrators? Oh, there's no doubt about it. After all, if uh, they weren't demonstrating, we'd be open Thursday night and Friday and Saturday. That's where we lost all our money. I thought it went over very well. I thought that what the Black Panthers were trying to accomplish, accomplished more by the nonviolence. Um, and I think New Haven did well, too, in preventing. Were you surprised that it was nonviolent? No, I wasn't. On the campus, the student strike continued. Cambodia is now a major issue added to student demands for a fair trial for the Black Panthers. Many students want the strike to end. There is division at Yale. Some say it will never be the same. When I say it changed the university, I mean that, that the university from now on, this one, as long as the people who've been here for the past couple of weeks are here, is going to be more outside of itself and less you know, closed in within its walls and, uh, and less uh, self-concerned. We're not trying to tear down. We're building. This is the beginning of building a new nation. The old nation is, the old nation is going to have to fall in a sense, but it's not being ripped down because the new nation is going, to, is going to rise up above it and show itself as the real voice of the people. The voice, if you want to talk in terms of majorities, is going to be the voice of the majority. I will say that it is another sign that on a large scale, blacks and whites have gotten together from across the country to express a common desire to improve the conditions in which we live and to rule out our hatred and to view each other as human beings in a total attempt to really change society. Whether this is done in a violent fashion uh, in the future will depend on how America responds to uh, the present cries of the young people in this country. The Huntley Brinkley Report is produced by NBC News. be a, a hypocritical point of view that's being put forth when it's carried out this way. A student at Kent State happened to have an old camera and one roll of film, but he managed to get a more vivid picture than any we have seen of the National Guard firing at the students. It's printed in this week's issue of Life magazine. It shows about 10 guardsmen taking aim with rifles and one with a pistol. They fired about 36 shots before an officer, indicated by the arrow, ordered a ceasefire. The general in command, in civilian clothes but for a gas mask, was slightly to the rear. It is said the guard first tried to quiet the students by aiming their loaded rifles at them, but when they continued to shout and throw tear gas cans back at the guardsmen, they opened fire. At fast with Bicetol, your stomach won't settle for less. At San Diego State College, about 150 campus demonstrators tried to lower the American flag to half-mast. 
Bill Pearson, a football star, six feet three, 250 pounds, stopped them and raised the flag back to the top. Today, he says he is overwhelmed at the support and congratulations from all over the country. The commander of the National Guard unit at Kent State now says there was a shot fired from somewhere else before his men opened fire. He had no idea where it came from. At Ohio University in Athens, about 300 students out of 20,000 were out early this morning throwing rocks and smashing windows. The governor put the Ohio National Guard on alert again in case they are needed on the campus. Jet. United Nations Secretary General Thon told the University of Texas today for decision in an indecisive war. The active, large-scale American and South Vietnamese participation in the fighting in Cambodia has brought a cry of anger from many college campuses. On Saturday night, demonstrators at Kent State University in Ohio burned the ROTC building to the ground. There was more trouble over the weekend, and today the protest turned into a riot with thousands of demonstrators facing National Guardsmen and police. Someone, possibly a sniper, started shooting, and a few minutes later, four protesters, two women and two men, were dead. For a report, here is John Hambrick of station WEWS in Cleveland. Four people were killed on that campus early this afternoon, and over a dozen injured. It all began when some 3,000 students defied an order not to assemble on the campus, and 300 National Guardsmen moved in to disperse the demonstrators with tear gas. Nobody is exactly sure what prompted the action, but the National Guardsmen opened fire. Some unconfirmed reports have it that the Guard was fired upon first by snipers, and the Guardsmen returned that fire. Newswatch reporters got these reactions from students who described what they saw. The students were protesting and walking around here. They had tear gas. They were throwing it back and forth. National Guard was throwing the tear gas at the students, and the students were throwing it back. And National Guard were marching up this hill. They turned around, got on their knees, and fired. Did you actually see any of the students being hit? I, I saw people fall. I don't know if they're being hit or if they just, you know, scared and just dropped in the dust. I don't know. Do you have any idea what caused it, why the shooting started in the first place? Uh, some of the students were throwing rocks at the National Guard. What about the uh, report that there was a sniper here? Did you hear anything about that? No. I was, I was on top of Johnson Wolf, and they said there was a sniper up there, and I was there, and there was none at all. Did you see any sniper activity around in this area? No, I didn't, except that it was just pointed out. Uh, when, by one of the faculty members, when I looked at the monument, the bullet hole did come from, it looks like, uh, a black position somewhere over in here. So conceivably, it would probably come from, from where the students had been. Yes, it does look that way. At the White House, the president issued a statement saying that he shares the sadness of the parents of those killed, and he added, quote, this should remind us all once again that when dissent turns to violence, it invites tragedy. There were less violent protests today from Columbia University in the east to Stanford in the west. And the National Student Association has called for a nationwide shutdown of universities beginning tomorrow. I'll have more news in a moment. The voice of dissent coming from the nation's colleges is far from being stilled. About a thousand demonstrators protesting U.S. Cambodian involvement marched on the federal building at Albany, New York. They cut off mail service in the New York State Capitol for six hours. In Portland, Oregon, 3,000 Portland State students marched to City Hall to protest force by police during a rock-throwing, tear-gas-filled melee last night. ABC's Dick Shoemaker has details. For almost a week, striking students had barricaded the streets around Portland State University. They even called one of the barricades Fort Tricia Nixon. But some students weren't laughing. They wanted the school strike to stop. We resent any minority group controlling our school, and we want to stop, and we want to stop now. We want the roadblocks out of there. We want the people. Many of the striking students started taking down the barricades, but about 100 strikers insisted they had a permit to stay. The hardcore demonstrators refused to move and the Portland Tactical Squad was called in.
<laughs> the outbreak lasted seven minutes. 28 of the demonstrators suffered minor injuries. Today, faculty members and students said they were shocked by all the violence. One bystander put it this way, I never believed a thing like this would happen in Portland. Dick Shoemaker, ABC News. At San Jose State College today, another group of students has taken firm steps away from violence and toward what they think is a more effective way of protesting the war. ABC's Bill Wordham has details in San Jose, California. Students today called on organized labor to support them in a nationwide strike. Them in their effort, all power to the people. The demand came from what the students call the National Student Congress. The Congress was born out of the frustration and outrage over last week's events in Cambodia and Ohio. United as never before by these events, students from across the country sent delegates to the Congress at San Jose State College. For the past two days, they have used the student union here as a national headquarters, trying to decide where they want to go from here. Their decision today was to avoid violence, but to express their opposition to war, racism, and poverty by every means other than violence. The students plan to do a lot of talking. They say they want to re-educate the country against war and violence, so that potential allies among the public will not be offended. The students are even cutting their hair, and for most of them, this is the ultimate gesture of their dedication. So they will go with their new hairstyle out into the communities and talk to people, talk to potential voters in a bid to get peace candidates elected at every level, everywhere. Some of the students have said they will go to any lengths to communicate with the establishment, even if it means the length of their hair. Bill Wardham at the Student Union, San Jose, California. I'll be back with more news. Very slim. Bob Clark, ABC News on Capitol Hill. While the senators debated, thousands of students stayed on strike. About 270 colleges are still closed down today. In Athens, Ohio, after a night of window smashing and arson, the governor put the National Guard on alert to calm down the Ohio University campus. Students at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts are protesting too, but in a decidedly different manner. ABC's Jim Burns has the story. If this were a normal spring day on the Smith College campus, pretty Sue McCone might be biking off to meet a date or to sun herself on the shores of Paradise Lake. But this is the spring of the Cambodian invasion, when college students all across America have abandoned normal pursuits and turned again to protest. The Smith College girls aren't marching in the streets, but many of them, like Sue McCone, have been goaded into action of a different kind by the Cambodian crisis. And they're determined to force foreign policy changes by peaceful but sustained political pressure. It's a total thing here. Um, before, there had been a lot of frustrations, a lot of rumblings. But suddenly, it all burst forward. This place has been transformed into, I'd say, almost a massive political office. You walk around this place, and you, you know people are involved all over the place. You have some people who have seized, I think, the moment and are determined to make their idealism real in a very practical sense. For instance, um, the community action groups that have been working here, going out into the community, canvassing, leafleting, standing there talking to the people. People's Lobby, which is the political organization that has grown out here, has produced in the past week a great amount of research on legislative action pending in both the Cambodian War and the Indochina War. We've been influencing and I believe affecting our congressmen in a very profound way. We've sent 110 girls to Washington lobbying with congressmen, meeting with Senator Brooks, Senator Kennedy, Representative Connie. It's a beautiful thing to see. So do you believe that a new kind of student political power is in the making now in this country because of Cambodia? Because of Cambodia and the consequent events of political oppression, yes, definitely. Before, I think there was, one could either respond silently or violently. One either held a candle or threw a stone. And it's not like that now. We know that we must respond quickly. We must respond purposefully and constructively. Despite her distress and disgust over Cambodia, Sue McCone believes deeply in the power of concerned students to affect fundamental changes in their government in a peaceful manner. Her beliefs will face a crucial test in the elections next November. This is Jim Burns, ABC News, Northampton, Massachusetts. I'll be back with more news in a moment.
Frank. Here in New York, there was another demonstration about the war, this one by students and workers who are opposed to it. ABC's Jim Burns has a report. It looked a little like yesterday all over again today on Lower Broadway, but this rally was much smaller than Wednesday's pro-war demonstration, and its theme was peace. About 20,000 persons attended today's City Hall demonstration. It marked the first time that students and union members had joined together here to protest the Asian War. Unions represented included the auto workers, electrical workers, and performers groups. Among the featured speakers, actor Ozzie Davis. We know that our first commitment must be to life, and that life means peace and love and opportunity. It does not mean war and destruction and profiteering. It does not mean murder on college campuses, whether in Mississippi or at Kent State. It means that men should truly strive to make the world a better place for themselves and all others. Near the rally's end, a shouting match developed between the peace protesters and backers of President Nixon's Asian policy, who had lined the sidewalk. Squads of police kept the opposing factions apart, and the rally passed without any reported incidents of violence. Jim Burns, ABC News, New York. We'll be back with more news in a moment. Students alike, to stand firmly for the right which exists in this country of peaceful dissent, and just as strongly against the resort to violence as a means of such expression. End of the direct quotation of the White House statement issued in the name of the President. White House News Secretary Ronald Ziegler followed it by saying, I'd like to have it clearly understood that the President supports peaceful dissent and opposes violence. The White House says that a Justice Department investigation probably will be made. Dan Rather, CBS News, the White House. Most campuses around the country were quiet today, but at the University of Maryland, students briefly blocked a main highway running by the school, and several hundred student and faculty members boycotted classes at Stanford University in California. Leaders of the relatively moderate National Student Association, which claimed membership on more than 500 college campuses, called for a nationwide student strike beginning tomorrow to protest the American presence in Cambodia. The NSA president, Charles Palmer, called the Kent State situation a but put much of the blame on provocation by the federal and state administration. You like them. Tear gas replaced textbooks on some college campuses today, but the bulk of the widespread student protest against the war was orderly. At least 114 colleges reported student strikes, some conducted with the sanction of the college administrations. But there were pockets of violence and destruction. At the University of California at Berkeley, students tried to burn the Navy ROTC building. Other campus fires destroyed a building at Northwestern University and burned out an ROTC building at Washington University in St. Louis, while students chanted, Remember Kent. The shooting deaths of four students at Kent State University aggravated campus tensions elsewhere. Authorities used tear gas to control rock-throwing crowds at such scattered locations as the University of Wisconsin, the University of Buffalo, and the University of Texas. For all the activity, however, reports from all sections of the country show the participants to be a minority of students. The large majority still seem more interested in education than protest. After the four Kent State students were shot to death yesterday by National Guardsmen, a Guard spokesman said that an Ohio highway patrol helicopter had spotted a sniper on a nearby building. But today, a highway patrol official said there is nothing in the logs about such an incident, and it would have been there if it had happened. For the story today on the Kent State campus, here is Ike Pappas. Today, the Kent State campus, under virtual martial law, guarded by some 2,000 troops and police, was sealed to everyone. So it was quiet. Classes were suspended indefinitely. But every now and again, there was a reminder, such as the campus flag at half-staff, of the tragedy of yesterday. The last of the students, most of them bewildered and angered over the killing of four of their classmates, packed their things and moved out. 
What movement there was came from investigators from the National Guard and the state police attempting to determine what happened on Taylor Hill at 12.20 yesterday afternoon when gunfire rang out. National Guardsmen opened fire with semi-automatic weapons. The guard says 16 or 17 weapons fired some 35 rounds. Four were killed. Two young men, William Schroeder of Lorain, Ohio, and Jeffrey Miller of Plainview, New York, and two young women, Sandy Lee Scheuer of Youngstown, Ohio, and Allison Krauss of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A dozen others were wounded. After the shooting, one young man dipped a black flag of revolution in the blood and waved it about as a symbol of the student's anger and frustration. One of the wounded, Douglas Rentmore, spoke of the incident today. Some guard commanders said that their men were threatened by a sniper, but the student said he saw no excuse for the shootings. Well, as far as I can figure out, it seems to be almost completely unjustified. Uh, Doug, did you... Uh, I didn't hear that. Did you say completely unjustified? Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, if there was a sniper, as some people say, he would have been on top of one of the buildings. He wouldn't have been shooting from the crowd, and they fired into the crowd, not up at the top of the building at a sniper. Doug, what do you think about what's happened to Kent State, what's happened to you? Well, I don't feel too bad, really, because I got out really lucky, but those kids that got killed, but there's nothing you can do, you know? I don't know. I, I don't want to see it happen again, because... It's just such a bad thing. Uh, in the event the men would run out of gas again, and something like this would happen, and they're being rushed by students, is there again this danger of being shot? Yes, uh, when an individual's life is at stake, uh, their troops are there to perform a mission, and uh, uh, there is certainly danger of an individual being shot. Not that uh, we want to shoot anybody, but it's just inconceivable that an individual would attempt to rush a trooper with a, a bayonet and a loaded weapon and expect him uh, to not to do anything to permit them uh, to beat him up or kill him. The general claims that there was a sniper up in a building. Well, you know, there wasn't any sniper in the crowd then, so why did he shoot into the crowd? They shot into the crowd. They didn't shoot over heads. Maybe some of the guardsmen were shooting over heads. Who knows? But they were coming at me, and the ground around me was being thrown up by, by bullets. The National Guard said that the men fired because they were being threatened with rocks. We consider rocks a lethal weapon, said one commander. Robert Shackney asked Guard General Robert Canterbury if he had a sniper report. I do not know. Uh, General, I don't want to press the point too hard. These are difficult circumstances, but I'm sure many people will be asking what possible justification there can be for firing bullets into a crowd of people, many of whom may be innocent bystanders, if in fact they have not necessarily fired on your troops. I think the only justification is for your own life that's in danger. What the investigators have to determine then is whether indeed there was a sniper and whether the guard was justified in firing its weapons, or whether, as some people here believe, the guard panicked under the pressure of a rock-throwing attack and fired its weapons indiscriminately into the crowd, killing four students. Ike Pappas, CBS News at Kent, Ohio. The dead students, William Schrader, 19, Lorraine, Ohio, the high school honor student, basketball star, and trumpet player. Sandra Lee Scheuer, 20, of Youngstown, Ohio, a junior majoring in speech therapy. She was graduated from high school with honors and maintained a 3.6 average on a four-point system. Jeffrey Miller, 20, of Plainview, New York, a high school honor graduate and a gifted mathematician majoring in drama. Allison Krauss, 19, of Pittsburgh, a freshman who wanted to be a teacher. Her father, Arthur Krauss, was interviewed in Pittsburgh by Paul Moyer of KDKA-TV. She resented being called a bum because she disagreed with someone else's opinion. She felt that war in Cambodia was wrong. Is this dissent a crime? Is this a reason for killing her? Have we come to such a state in this country that a young girl has to be shot because she disagrees deeply with the actions of her government? I want something to be done. What I would like to see happen is that my daughter's death 
and those of the other three children, as well as the wounded, not be in vain. I would like to see Congress investigate the situation and determine who authorized live ammunition to be brought against children by a tired and frightened National Guard. A chief question in dispute today is whether the National Guard reacted within limits yesterday. For a report on its crowd control regulations, here's Stephen Rowan in Washington. Ohio National Guard officials say the units involved yesterday have seen this U.S. Army training film and others like it have had 32 hours of training each year in the control of riots. On such points as how to deal with a sniper, Ohio says its procedures follow the U.S. Army manual to the letter. The manual tells the troops not to lay down a barrage of fire. The film tells them how to go after the man with the gun. The sniper's capture must be carefully directed. Spotlights locate him. A selected marksman provides suppressive fire. And a CS grenade is ready to force him out. Again and again, the film says use only the minimum force necessary. Regular Army troops would not have been carrying loaded weapons, but since 1966, Ohio Guardsmen have gone into such confrontations with bullets in their rifles. You may be greatly outnumbered, but remember that your training and proper conduct, the image you present of a neat, well-disciplined soldier, give you a practical, psychological advantage over an unruly, emotional mob. These confrontations demand much of you. You must work within an atmosphere of explosive emotionalism and yet remain calm and rational. You will be subjected to the worst extremes of provocation and yet you must be guided only by logical thought. When every natural instinct within you begs for action, you must remain passive. The cause of student anti-war demonstration, Mrs. Richard Nixon has called off her planned visit to some... The cause of continuing campus unrest over the war, aggravated by the shooting deaths of the Kent State students, Governor Ronald Reagan denies closing all 27 of California state universities and colleges for four days. Reagan urged the institutions, 320,000 students, that's one-twelfth of the nation's total college enrollment, to use the time to reflect on the grave sequence of current events and their own responsibilities. A report on the situation today at the University of California at Berkeley from Terry Drinkwater. The biggest of the University of California schools, Berkeley, went on strike before Governor Reagan's announcement. This convocation was the largest anti-war rally even this campus has ever seen. The Nixon course in Cambodia has no other issue as united radical students, moderate students, and much of the faculty. All rhetoric aside, we have a choice. I am certain that in the course of history, imperialism and genocide will be stopped in Vietnam, in New Haven, in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and all around the world. And the issue, the issue that you have to confront is whether you and I will liberate this country here from the inside or whether it will be liberated from abroad. The all men had expected trouble during and after the convocation. Reagan's canceling of classes, however, changed that. And today, for the first time since the extent of U.S. involvement in Cambodia became known, the campus was peaceful. But militants have already indicated they'll use the next few days to plan still more vehement and violent statements against the war. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Berkeley. Boston University, Brown, and Tufts have suspended classes for the rest of the school year. Governor Rhodes has ordered Ohio State closed. Nationwide campus protest generally has been orderly. Most commonly, it takes the form of a student strike. A national coordinating center at Brandeis University says there were 240 such strikes today. Scattered violence also persists, however. In Kentucky, Governor Lewis Nunn ordered state police and national guardsmen with mounted bayonets and live ammunition onto the University of Kentucky campus. They're there to enforce a 7 p.m. curfew. 
A 21-year-old co-ed has been charged with firebombing the ROTC building on that campus. And the Texas State Capitol was evacuated because of a bomb threat connected with a march by University of Texas demonstrators. Brigadier General Robert Canterbury of the Ohio National Guard said today that guardsmen were fired on Monday before they shot and killed the four students at Kent State. We know the troops were shot at, but we cannot say where the shots came from, he said. Meanwhile, roughly half the guardsmen, about 400, left that campus. Ike Pappas reports some of the following film he narrates, though, was damaged in processing. All right, man, we're going to hold today. We'll leave out of here sometime this afternoon. Charlie Company, the 145th Infantry Battalion, Ohio National Guard, turned in its riot gas and its live ammunition this morning and prepared to pull out of the battlefield at Kent, Ohio. The men were cold and tired and still jittery from the rioting. Some of the men of Charlie Company, who asked that their names not be revealed, spoke of what they had gone through since arriving last Saturday night. People throw rocks and bricks at us. The kid got his kneecap shattered with a wrench. Nobody cares about us. All they care about them poor pigs up there that got killed. They can throw rocks at us and we're just going to stand there with pebble. They're, they're pebble throws just for us. That's not the way it is. Did they throw rocks at you? Damn yeah, right they threw rocks at us. I came here Saturday night. I was super scared Saturday night I was going to get it. It was pebble. We went on top of a hill when that fire was down there. I never been so scared in all my life. It looked like about three or four hundred of them just but you weren't up on the hill when the people were shot. We watched them get shot. We watched them. We were at the hospital. We were looking right out the window. We was getting ready. We was all lying. All I understand was there was supposed to be a confirmed sniper on Johnson How do you feel about what happened to those people? How do I feel? I feel it's about time one of them got it right there. Why? I mean, I don't, I don't like to see anybody get killed, but I mean, we come up here, these people, all they do is stand around and give you a peace sign, throw rocks at you, harass you, call you dirty names. We're, we're no one sleeping with your wife, ain't none of their business in the first place. I mean, I don't like to be here, I'm losing money at work. I signed up, I wouldn't shoot anybody. I'll even let load my weapon when I'm on that hill. Why would I want to shoot innocent kids? throwing rocks at you, but... Well, what would make a guardsman, you know, use his weapon? Somebody shooting at them. Which was the case. You think that's what happened? That's what happened. We heard the shots first. The sniper claim has been made before by the troops, but many of the students at the scene have denied it. And so Charlie Company departed today, leaving behind investigators from the National Guard, the State Police, and the Justice Department to determine where the truth lies. Ike Pappas, CBS News, Kent, Ohio. The Senate's Democratic and Republican leaders, Mansfield and Scott, jointly asked President Nixon today to establish a high-level commission to investigate the Kent State shootings. They called the event tragic in its happening and ominous in its implication. President Nixon, meantime, met with six Kent State students who paid their own way to Washington to talk about the tragedy with officials. David Schumacher reports. The six who met with the president would be considered straight by many students. Their ties, short haircuts, and majors in things like business administration give them away. But even these straight students blamed Kent State's troubles on the National Guard and said Mr. Nixon seemed well briefed on campus protest. He said it was his belief that dissent would be minimized across the nation when his administration accomplished four basic goals. These were, one, get out of this war, two, don't get involved in similar situations. Three, reduce armaments. And four, create a volunteer army. Our opinion from talking to the president this, after, this morning was that he was very concerned about what was happening on the college campuses and that he is very interested in attempting to find a solution to the problems that have arisen. Uh, in regards to what the president has said, I think violence does breed violence, but I don't think the, uh, what we tried to tell the president was that there is no uh, communication between the administrations of many of the colleges uh, in this country and the students. I think if these issues are brought, are discussed and are never uh, acted upon, it seems like nobody's listening, then I'm sure, myself I was not a demonstrator, but I feel sure they think that's almost the only way they can make yourself heard now, because nobody in the past has listened. 
None of these students took part in the Kent State demonstrations, but two watched. They say there were no snipers, that the guardsmen who opened fire were not surrounded or even threatened. The president assured the six that American troops will be out of Cambodia well before July 1st, not just by July 1st. The students assured the president there will be more violence on campus unless someone starts to listen. David Schumacher, CBS News, Washington. President Nixon on Friday will hold his first news conference since the Cambodian crisis, but no time was set. Denture wears keep coming back to Palazant. An estimated 136 colleges across the country are officially closed today because of war protests and the killing Monday of four Kent State University students. The entire California system, the largest in the nation, remains shut down along with Ohio State University. Tufts University, reported shut down, said today that no classes have been canceled. Funeral services were held today for two of the Kent State students shot by National Guardsmen. William Shorter was buried in Lorain, Ohio, and Jeffrey Miller in New York City. Robert Shackney and Morton Dean report. All of us, and millions throughout the country today, are struggling with what to say, what to do, and what to believe. When the world is torn with conflicting ideologies, confrontation brings such deep personal tragedy. His friends, his classmates, his teachers were all there at the funeral today of Bill Schroeder, 19 years old, of Lorain, Ohio. Bill Schroeder, who'd been an Eagle Scout athlete and honor student, and who at Kent State University had been an ROTC cadet near the top of his class, who hoped someday to be an officer in the United States Army. The service followed the simple rites of the United Church of Christ. The mourners, his parents, his brother and sister, his other relatives, and many, many of the boys and girls he'd grown up with here in Lorraine. Dead which die in the Lord, yea, sent the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow after them. Let us pray. Bill wasn't a rioter or radical, his college roommate said. He was a brilliant guy who thought a lot about a lot of things, and it's such a waste. Bill Schroeder wasn't a political activist either. His friends say he'd just been watching but not taking part in the demonstration on campus last Monday that ended so abruptly with the gunfire from the National Guard. And his friends also say that Bill, like they, often worried and wondered about the war in Vietnam. There were no political words spoken today at the funeral. The Reverend Donald Yackel reciting psalms and then simply calling for a renewal of faith in God and of love among men. They had never heard of Jeffrey Glenn Miller till the shots were fired on Monday at Kent State. 4,000 persons, most of them young, converged on a memorial chapel in Manhattan. While funeral services were being conducted in a high ceiling, dimly lighted chapel inside. The main eulogy was delivered by Dr. Benjamin Spock. His death and the death of the other three young people at Kent State uh, may be a blessing. I'm quite serious in believing uh, that the deaths of these young people may do more to end the war in Vietnam and to set America on a better course than only the rest of us have been able to do in the last uh, five years of the uh, escalation of the war. The services were over, and many of those who waited on the streets raised their hands in a forest of salutes. The V for peace, the clenched fist symbolizing the radical slogan, power to the people. Let us be silent and quiet and respectful. Let us remember one thing. Let us not engage in the violence been taught to us by our leaders and our elders. The hearse carrying the plain brown hardwood coffin eased its way from the chapel through the Manhattan streets, followed for many blocks by a large, sad, and silent crowd. The hearse was destined for suburban Hartsdale, New York, where this afternoon the body of Jeffrey Glenn Miller, age 20, was cremated.
Morton Dean, CBS News, New York. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration announced today that it... David Culhane in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Good evening. Richard Nixon, before becoming president, wrote a book about turning points in his life entitled Six Crises. Tonight, he's embroiled in the seventh, and its name is Cambodia. In deciding to send U.S. troops into that Southeast Asian nation, Mr. Nixon acknowledged the domestic political hazards involved. But he could not foresee that the widespread reaction on the campuses would result in the shooting deaths of four students and create a rallying cause for a new attack on the war. In consequence, the reported 438 institutions of higher education, one out of every six in the nation, is closed down or on strike. Thousands of young people are arriving in Washington for weekend demonstrations. The issue certainly will be a subject for the president in his nationally televised news conference tonight to be carried by CBS at 10 o'clock Eastern time. The Cambodian reaction has not been confined to the young. Daniel Shore reports. Here on Capitol Hill, it is not the usual quiet Friday of the long congressional weekend. The hawks have mostly flown, but the doves have stayed behind for a spirit of activity aimed at convincing students that the war can be halted in Congress and not on the streets. There isn't a political figure in this country that would not respond more to youth if they felt millions of young people would be out campaigning for or against them just before this November election, 1970. A dozen senators and representatives led by Senator George McGovern launched a nationwide petition campaign to get backing for their bill to cut off money for the war. And Senator Edmund Muskie announced a new resolution, a Senate declaration of peace. We think there's only one way that's effective in bringing the war to an end, and that's to operate uh, within the uh, constitutional system. That's what we propose to do. Any demonstration of violence uh, will be exploited by those who want to, to keep the war going as an indication that the opponents of the war are irresponsible. Our objective in South Vietnam was to buy the people of South Vietnam time. Time to build their own country. Now we need time to rebuild our own country. And so we need a new policy in South uh, East Asia. A policy clearly committed to ending the war and ending our involvement in it. There is a double reason for all the congressional anti-war activity today. The Doves hope to enlist these students and their parents behind Stop the War resolutions, which at this point don't have much of a chance. And they hope to give the students a peaceful focus for their protest. Daniel Shaw, CBS News on Capitol Hill. Reaction elsewhere in Washington included a statement by more than 250 State Department employees expressing deep concern and apprehension over the involvement in Cambodia. They urged Secretary of State Rogers to seek reconsideration of Southeast Asian policy. Delegates to the League of Women Voters Convention departed from a tradition of silence about the war to express concern. They asked the president to listen to the voice of all the people. In their words, the young and the mature, the poor and the affluent, the farm, the suburb, the city, and the campus. Education Secretary James Allen, asked by a student why he has not resigned to protest the Cambodian decision, told the youth, quote, unless this administration changes its attitude, there are going to be a lot of resignations. The Justice Department anticipates up to 100,000 participants in tomorrow's rally, and the administration today reached a compromise with its leaders on a site for the protest. David Schumacher reports. The Ellipse is a large open area just south of the White House in clear view of President Nixon's office as well as his private living area. The demonstrators wanted to be sure Mr. Nixon knew they were out there, and there's no way now that he can miss them. Justice Department spokesmen say they're depending on the young volunteer marshals who've been training around the clock to carry a major part of the burden of keeping the peace. Are you worried? Yes, very. But I think that the main reason I'm going down is because I don't want the word to get around that it's just always violent. I think that's wrong. While some of the marshals have had experience in earlier demonstrations, they have no real idea of what or how many to expect. Because of the rush planning, officials are not much better off. 
the newspaper accounts have been about as uh, about as accurate, quite frankly, as my own uh, intelligence is. And uh, the indications that we have are that there is certainly no planned violence. That uh, there may be and may not be. I think this is subject to some question, some uh, peaceful. Uh, Nonviolent demonstrations, and uh, but we have no indications at this time that there is any planned violence. I would anticipate that it will be a very orderly, peaceful uh, weekend. Mobilization coordinator Ron Young told reporters the demonstrators will not attack the police or soldiers. We will talk with them, we will work with them, we will encourage them to join us. We will not attack them. Will you break the cordon? If the, if yes or no? No or yes? We are not going to break through lines of soldiers or police. We're going to talk with them and encourage them to join us. Lafayette Square, in front of the White House, had been the first choice of demonstrators, but they're satisfied with the ellipse on the other side of the mansion. Lafayette Square today was filled with early arrivals and the setting for everything from guerrilla theater to young lovers holding hands. Officials tonight think they have done everything reasonable to meet the demands. They say now whether there is peace or violence tomorrow is up to the demonstrators. David Schumacher, CBS News, Washington. CBS News will present periodic reports of tomorrow's demonstrations in Washington and summarize the day's activities in a special one-hour report beginning at 7.30 Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow evening. With the new anti-war demonstrations impending, the House today released testimony by FBI Director J. Edgar... National Guard troops on his campus. Vice President Agnew offered some views last night on the shooting deaths of the four Kent students. He spoke during a taping of Westinghouse Broadcasting's David Frost show, which will be seen next Wednesday. If it's discovered there was no shot fired at them by a sniper and they just opened fire without a warning shot or anything uh, not having been fired at in any way i mean in that sense what is is the word for that murder yes uh but not first degree as a lawyer uh, i'm conversant and i suppose most most people are who followed the the courts are conversant with the fact that where there's no premeditation but simply a an over response in the heat of anger that results in a killing uh, it's a murder it's 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 not a premeditated but it's a murder and it certainly can't be condoned but i would guess that if uh, a very volatile young man got a, a brick in the neck or in the ribs, he might uh, just blow up and, and do something like that. College presidents who met with President Nixon yesterday said he had promised to tone down the criticism of college students by administration members, including Mr. Agnew. Today, Mr. Agnew said he has not been, as he put it, muzzled. And in a speech prepared for delivery in Boise, Idaho tonight, he hits out at what he calls choleric young intellectuals and tired, bewildered elders who are attacking the president's Cambodian policy. He accuses Senator J. William Fulbright of offering what he calls the baldest and most reactionary plea for isolationism ever heard in the Senate since World War II. This was the 25th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. The French held a big parade in... Potential policy is still a moot point. Roger. Tomorrow at 1.30 uh, at the White House, the president meets with the governors to discuss campus protests and violence and presumably standards of National Guard conduct. And Pentagon sources say that by the summer of 1971, the U.S. troop level in South Vietnam could...